OK, we're looking at the worry blues on page 23. We're answering question one. What is the relationship between the blues singer and his music? So the third to last line, the singer has stopped playing. He has gone to bed. But the second to last line, the music keeps going on in his head. So it's not like once he sings about his sadness, he no longer feels sad. It's not like singing about his sadness actually helps him. And that's why the last line, he slept like a rock or a man that's dead. Not a human, not somebody with a future to look forward to. So what is the relation between the singer and his music? It's not just an expression of himself. It's also a symbol for his experience. Like the music is not a tool he uses to heal himself. The music is a part of him. After he finishes singing, it's still there. They are not separate. They are reflective of his own experience and cannot be taken out of him. Like they say, you can take the blues player out of the bar, but you cannot take the blues out of the blues player. That kind of idea. It's a part of his identity, the music. And that also tells us how deeply he is suffering in his life. So the blues, uh, sorry, the blues is one of two forms of American music that are traditionally connected to black people. The other one is jazz, dress. And from this poem, you can kind of see why. Yeah. Question two, would it be a problem to retell white stories with black culture? OK, note on commercial theater. Notice it says commercial theater, not art house theater. So this theater is putting on performances for the general public. You've taken my blues and gone. You sing them on Broadway. You sing them in Hollywood Bowl. So immediately we have the main idea blues are a black kind of music. But you, whoever you is, you took my blues and you put them on Broadway. Broadway is, of course, notoriously white. Line four, and you mixed him up with symphonies, Zhao Xiangyue, and you fixed them so they don't sound like me. Yep, you done taken my blues and gone. You took them and you ran, and now I can't see my music. I can't see myself in your performance. You also took my spirituals and gone. Spirituals are a traditional form of religious music. Uh, people say that jazz came from the blues and blues came from spirituals. And spirituals were sung by enslaved people after they were finished working for the day or even while they were working. So it's very tied up with black culture. So you also took my spirituals and gone. You put me in Macbeth, which is a Shakespeare play. And Carmen Jones, which is a popular, uh, again, white musical and all kinds of swing Mikados, and in everything but what's about me. So same idea, you took my music to tell your stories. But someday, somebody will stand up and talk about me and write about me, black and beautiful, and sing about me, and put on plays about me. I reckon it'll be me myself. Yes, it'll be me. So the question is, 
is there a problem with telling white stories using black culture? According to this poem, there is a problem. And the big problem is when you use black culture to tell white stories, the black stories disappear. He can no longer see himself in these white versions of black culture. Right, if you think about the last poem, the blues player, you see a black person playing and singing the blues about his own life and culture. But if the music is coming from a white person and they have changed it and they are talking about their own story, is it still black culture? And this is not just a theoretical discussion. Especially in the United States, this happens very, very often. For example, Elvis Presley, Mao Wang, white guy, but his music started out as black music. Uh, when he was younger, he was influenced by black musicians that he saw performing, and he learned that music, and he added a little bit of guitar, added a little bit of drums, turned it into what we call rock and roll. And suddenly it became white music. So this kind of thing is often happening. Uh, even more recently on social media, internet slang is often started by black people based on the way that black people talk. But on the internet, things spread without context, without reason, and Internet slang is spoken by all kinds of people, not just black people. And so that part of black slang and black language loses its cultural specific meaning. Uh, I once read an article talking about how basically every important cultural development in the US started from black people, including things like comedy. Apparently the first person to actually stand on stage and perform comedy by talking to the audience was a black person. Um, so this poem is using a personal story to talk about a big cultural problem in the US. Of course, not just the US, but you know, this is American literature. Question three, is there irony in silhouette? This one. One group took this question and they believe, yes, there is irony. So let's take a look. A silhouette is um, the shape of a person. Southern gentle lady, do not swoon. To swoon means to faint, ring dao. They've just hung a black man in the dark of the moon. So they hung, they, today we say hanged. They hanged a black man to die at night. They've hung a black man to a roadside tree in the dark of the moon for the world to see how Dixie protects its white womanhood. Dixie is the American South. So this stanza is saying the reason these people hung, uh, hanged a black man is, they say, to protect white women. Southern gentle lady, be good, be good. So according to the group who took this question, the irony is that the poem is comforting a white woman because they are afraid that she might suffer from seeing a black man being hanged to death. Of course, the black man is the one who suffered more. Um, and this poem is actually still kind of gentle because really when um, hangings like this happened, they call this lynching. When a lynching happened, it's not just about hanging the black person on a tree. They would often cut off parts of their body, burn the body alive, 
uh, and it would be treated as like a party or a picnic and the whole white community would come to watch this event. So it's not just dying, it's also physical pain and also uh, spiritual humiliation. And yet this poem focuses on the so-called suffering of a white woman. So that's the first layer of irony. There's another deeper layer. It says, line 9, line 10, that they lynch black people to protect the white women. The idea is that uh, they were very scared that black people were, especially black men, were uncivilized animals who could not control their desires. And so if you don't keep control of these black men, they will attack and rape our white wives and daughters and sisters. Of course, that's not true, right? Black people have self-control just like white people and may not even like your mother or sister or daughter or wife. But that's the excuse that they used to lynch black people. So often what would happen in real life is that a white woman would have an affair with a black man. And when they wanted to end the affair or if they were afraid of being discovered. Or like if the black man uh, tried to make it public, they would scream and shout that the black man was raping her. Uh, and then everybody would come and grab the black man and lynch him. So in the last two lines, it says Southern gentle lady, be good, be good. And this is a hint. If a black person or a black man wants to avoid being lynched, it's not enough for him to be good. Any white person that he encounters also must decide not to lynch him. Whether or not a black person is lynched does not depend on what the black person does. It depends on how the white people around him, usually him, think of him and react to him. So that's the second layer of irony. In order to prevent a black man from being lynched, a white woman has to be good. Uh, this logic, uh, unfortunately, still happens in the United States today. Lynching is, of course, illegal, and it's been a long time since someone has actually lynched a black person. But black people in the US still die far more often than white people, especially being killed by police. Uh, and often people in the media or like white people will say, uh, you know, this black person who got killed by the police, he was doing something wrong. He was running away. He was doing this. He was doing that. Uh, again, usually it's a man. Women also, but usually it's a man. But the fact of the matter is whether or not a black person is shot by the police is not determined by the black person themselves. It is the attitude and reaction of the police. So today this poem might be white police officer, be good, be good. The most famous example is uh, back in early 2020 when the US was protesting the death of Eric Garner and uh, George Floyd. Um, you know, the news media all went to report on the protests. Sometimes after the sun went down, the police would start arresting everybody. So one time a reporter for CNN was standing in front of the camera, talking to the camera about this protest. And the reporter was black. He was a black man. As he was talking to the camera, the police arrested him. He obviously was a member of the press. He was working for CNN. He was talking to the camera, but the police arrested him anyway. So it truly does not matter what a black person does. Whether or not he lives at the hands of police is up to the police. 
And see, this is the kind of reason why Langston Hughes, the poet, is still important today. Whether it's the blues, whether it's violence against black people, whether it's what we call cultural appropriation, stealing other people's culture. All of these issues are still happening today. Number four, why is Theme for English be a poem instead of an essay? Does it work better as a poem? One group took this question and they said, yes, it does work better as a poem. The language is more simple and direct. And it's shorter. So it's easier for the reader to understand what it's talking about. So the poem also is about some ideas. But it, sim it seems to work better as a poem instead of an essay. So the ideas are here. Line. Uh, 17, I guess. I guess I'm what I feel and see and hear. Harlem, Haring Chu, I hear you. Hear you, hear me, we too, you, me, talk on this page. I hear New York too. Me, who? Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe, Yendo, for a Christmas present. Or records, Tsangpian, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. Three different kinds of music. Um, so line 27. So will my page, will this poem be colored that I write? Will what I write be black poetry? Will it be black essays? Being me, it will not be white, but it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me, as I am a part of you. That's American. So if this were an essay, he would be using logic and examples to prove this point. But as a poem, he can simply use the word order and switching perspectives, flipping back and forth, back and forth until you can't tell the difference. And therefore he proves that you are part of me just like I am part of you. There's also the use of poetic characteristics like rhyming and rhythm and performance. So it's not just reading reasons and arguments. You're actually imagining the poet talking to you using these words and explaining to you exactly what he thinks. So these are some reasons why it works better as a poem than an essay. Let's take a short break and we'll come back to discuss question five.
Question five. Was Langston Hughes writing for white readers? Is his poetry aimed at showing white people the black life experience? Well, there's one poem that we have not yet looked at. On page 24, words like freedom. I think this is a good example. We already know what the other poems are talking about. So we can think about this question in terms of those poems and this poem. Words like freedom. There are words like freedom, sweet and wonderful to say. On my heartstrings, freedom sings all day, every day. So the word heartstring is comparing his heart to a musical instrument, qi, with strings. So it echoes in his heart and it creates beautiful music. There are words like liberty. Liberty just means freedom. That almost make me cry. If you had known what I know, you would know why. So the seventh line is the key line. If you had known what I know. So do you know? You don't know, but if you did know what I know, you would know why freedom and liberty are such beautiful words to me. So line seven is saying that the reader does not know the value of freedom and liberty. They have not had to think about the value of freedom and liberty. Most likely because they have always been free. They have never suffered the injustice of being unfree. They've never had to think about it. They've always had it. So it does look like he's writing this for a white person. From his point of view, it's mostly black people who do not have the same rights, who are not treated equally, who are not truly free. So when he talks about the value of words like freedom and liberty, black people know exactly what he means. It's only white people who have to think about it, who have to trust him about how strongly he feels instead of feeling it themselves. So if you had known what I know, you would know why. Uh, and then we can think about the other poems, right? Silhouette, literally talking to a white woman. Theme for English B, literally talking to his white teacher. Note on commercial theater, you've taken my blues. So you is also a white person. And then, the Weary Blues. This poem is the least clear about who it is uh, being written for. But you can think about this. The blues are a black music that express black suffering. Black people know this. You don't have to tell them. So these last few lines about how the blues player also suffers and that the music is not just a performance does seem to be talking to white people. It's telling white people about this relationship. So this is an interesting issue. Langston Hughes, one of the most famous black poets in American literature, was writing for white people. Does that seem strange to you? It's like saying the most famous Taiwanese author is writing for Americans. Kind of strange, right? What about the black people themselves? What kind of literature, what kind of music and art and culture do they enjoy? Who is writing for them? Who is performing for them? 
well, the answer, one answer is, of course, the blues music itself is for black people who resonate. It's the poem that explains the blues music that is for white people. Black people don't need to be explained about blues. So same with literature, right? Uh, when they have oral poetry, when they have literature about the experience of growing up black in different parts of the country, like comparing Harlem in New York to Georgia in the South to California, that kind of literature would be more interesting to black people. But here Hughes is writing about the comparison between black experience and white experience. And this would be less interesting to black people because they all know that it's different. It's white people who have to be reminded that the black people they see every day are not equal citizens at this time. OK, and then question six, how can you tell it was written in the interwar era? So again, let's take a look at the. Characteristics of this literary period. So we have this emigration and internal migration. Emigration is leaving the country. Internal migration is moving from one part of the country to another. Um, and this is mostly talking about black people moving from the south to the north. So when they get to the north, they encounter more white people of a different culture, white people who may not be used to seeing black people everywhere. So we have things like uh, the interactions between black and white, which is a lot of what Langston Hughes is talking about. And he also writes about like uh, Broadway, Broadway and Hollywood. So that's related to internal migration. Then Langston Hughes is the representative poet of the Harlem Renaissance, Haring Wen Yifuxing, which is an explosion of black literature and culture that finally made white people pay attention to them. So again, it's black art for white audience. Uh, and you can also say that starting from the Great Depression, white people also more and more began to experience a life of suffering, and that helped them understand black culture. The blues, jazz started to make more sense to white people when everybody was poor and everybody was suffering. So those are some of the characteristics of the interwar era that we can see in Langston Hughes's poetry. You also have other similar works of literature, like 1940, Richard Wright's Native Son. This was a novel also talking about the black experience, and it was also written for white people, and white people love this book. They feel like they really learn from this book. So it's similar to why many people like Langston Hughes. OK, do you have questions about today's discussion? All right, so uh, let me pass out the next handout and we'll talk about the late 20th century.
Before I introduce the period, I want to tell you what you should read for next week. And I am very, very sorry. Next week, we're going to read a novella, Zongpian Xiao Shuo, by James Baldwin. And we're going to talk about Baldwin a little later. He's here. The novella is called Sonny's Blues. That's why I kept talking about blues music. And it starts on page two, and it ends on page 24. So that's 23 pages. 22, because this is like only the top half. And I thought long and hard about whether to assign this story. I know that most of you, probably none of you, will finish this story before next week. Even those of you who love this course and try to finish everything probably will not finish. But this story is too important and too amazing that I just have to make you read and think about some of it. So in this case, I encourage you to use my PowerPoint as a guide to jump to the parts that are more, uh, to me, I think, worth discussing. Um, on the other hand, the language is quite easy to understand. This is specifically written for white people specifically to explain a specific idea about why black people are always afraid. Um, so the language is in standard English and it was written for a wide audience. It doesn't use anything too difficult. The hardest part of the story is the idea. So if you do have time and you have extra energy and you work really hard, you may be able to finish the story. So that's next week. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Gosh. Wait, why? It should be recording, right? It's recording. OK, yeah, so. Uh, I think it's something wrong with the microphone. I didn't do anything on the computer. OK, so hopefully everybody online caught that. If you didn't catch that, um, you saw me move the screen to page 24. So it's a long story. OK, so uh, the late 20th century starts after the end of World War II. Technically, it uh, includes two smaller periods, but there's a lot of debate about how to divide these periods. The first one is post-war, after the Second World War. And many people think it goes up to 1980, 1990, maybe even 2001. And then after that is called the contemporary period, Dang Dai, which goes up to today. And there's also a lot of debate about how to divide this. Not important. We're just going to call everything the late 20th century. The first important work of this period is J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, Mai Tian Bu So. It's a novel. It's a short novel, but it's a novel uh, about a young white man coming back from college he thinks that life is very boring. He doesn't know why he's alive. But in the end, he realizes that he is alive because he cares about his younger siblings and he hopes that he can prevent them from feeling the same way about life. And it was a very popular novel because after the war, um, you know, many soldiers came back and they suddenly realized that civilian life is very different from military life. In the military, you do what you are ordered to do and your success or failure is very clear. In regular life, not true. You are free to do whatever you want 
and nobody can tell you whether you are successful or not. So it's very aimless, directionless, So a lot of people really uh, resonated with this novel. They really felt like the main character in this novel. Not sure why they're alive, not sure what they're doing, but they remember that it's not just about themselves, they also have their friends and their family. Salinger is a famously reclusive and unproductive author. He wrote this novel and a collection of three short stories, and that's it. But all of these works are very clear and uh, strong in uh, conveying this idea about life. 1952, Ralph Ellison, black man, publishes the novel Invisible Man. And this is also about the black experience. It's also written for white people, but it's sometimes considered science fiction. Because what this novel is doing is it's saying. It's like white people can't even see black people in life. They ignore black people. They don't care about black people. It's like black people are invisible to them. And from this idea, Ellison creates the main character who is literally invisible. White people literally cannot see him and uses that to explore white attitudes towards uh, black people. Also a very famous and important novel. 1955, on the cultural uh, dimension, at this point, half of US households have a television. So the power of television is increasing and that will have major effects on culture and politics uh, in the second half of the 20th century. 1956, Allen Ginsberg publishes his poem, Howl. It's a long poem. I think in Chinese we call this Pao Xiao, or like Ho, something like that. Ginsburg started what we call the beat movement or the beat generation. And the idea is uh, writers who do not feel like they are successful, who do not feel like society cares about them. These are white people, by the way, white people who feel left out of society and they create literature from the margins of society. So Hui Bian Ren. Howl is a poem that does not fit into the traditional shapes of poetry. Remember reading E. E. Cummings, right? In just and uh, like the poems that move all over the page. Howl is kind of like that, but the words themselves are also bigger, smaller, fragmented. It really uses the 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 shape of the words and the space of the page to express his frustration at being on the outside of society. And many people um, felt their own experience in this kind of literature. Another writer from the Beat Generation is 1957. Jack Kerouac wrote his novel On the Road. It's a road trip novel. Story of a few uh, two guys and a girl traveling in a car across the United States. Today we understand this kind of literature. We know that nothing important is going to happen. The story is about their relationship. The story is about the experience. But at the time this was new. People did not know how to react to a novel with no important idea, with no clear structure, with no good people or at least like uh, mainstream publishers, critics, professors didn't know how to understand this kind of book. But readers, really, uh, especially readers who are also not very successful in life, uh, could feel this uh, feeling of being between the society, not in society, but in between society. Jia zai jia feng zong. Another uh, important novel, 1962, Ken Casey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. This is a novel about a psychiatric institution, uh, Jing Sen Bing Rin. And the point is that uh, according to this story, 
the people in there are crazy, not because they're crazy, but because the people in control of the hospital make them crazy. All of the rules that they have to follow, all of the um, medicine they have to take, all of the uh, things that they have to obey from the doctor are what really makes them crazy. This was later made into an Oscar winning movie starring Jack Nicholson. And according to Wikipedia, the Chinese title is Fei Rie Du Zhen Wu. And this novel really started what we today call the counterculture, Fan Wen Hua. It's also related to the Vietnam War, Rie Zan. So the idea is before this, people generally trusted the government. They didn't necessarily like the government, but if the government said this is what's happening, people believed them. But with the Vietnam War, people started to realize that the government often lies to the public. They say we're not fighting a war in Vietnam. We're doing a police action of hundreds and thousands of soldiers. They say the government is not spying on you when in fact the government is spying on you. They say we are not trying to overthrow democracies around the world who support the Soviet Union. When in fact the CIA started multiple coups when a government uh, seems to go against the United States. All of this stuff is what the government has lied to the American public about. And when people started realizing this, they also started realizing that a lot of their culture also was not genuine. It was not something that they truly agreed with. Not just the government, but schools, cities, family structures. All of these suddenly seemed to be very restricting. And there was a good reason for this. The 50s were actually very, very conservative. And the one reason is because after the Second World War, I should say during the Second World War, all of the men were fighting. So again, lots of jobs were being done by women. But when the men came home, especially in the United States, this time most of them came home, right? In the First World War, a lot of them died. But this time most of them came home and when they came home they took back all of their jobs and they forced women back home to take care of the children uh, and so the entire culture at that time was very conservative the 60s was a reaction to the 50s so uh, some key elements of the counterculture include being anti-war including social protest protest at the way society values different people and different things. So also like protesting against capitalism, protesting against big companies. The using of illegal drugs, drug culture. This is when people really started to smoke weed, to use acid and LSD, to use meth. Um, and that is the beginning of how drugs became culturally more acceptable in the United States. And then, of course, you had authors from the beat generation writing about life on the margins of society. The height of the counterculture was 1968. Uh, not just in the US, but also in France, in Europe, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and um, it took a little bit of time to get there, right? So in 1964, after many, many years of protest and um, demonstrations, the government of Lyndon B. Johnson, Chang Sen Zong Tong, finally passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. If you remember, after the Civil War ended, the Constitution was amended to protect the rights of black people, including the right to vote. But later the Supreme Court are, uh, agreed that just because black people have the right to vote does not mean that they have the same right to vote and that uh, local governments can introduce laws 
that treat black people differently from white people. Uh, and in practice, that often prevented black people from voting or from using the rights that the law says that they have. So 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act made those actions illegal. They said that if you truly, uh, you have to treat black people equally to white people. Uh, I should note that the Voting Rights Act was a few years ago weakened by the current Supreme Court. One part of the Voting Rights Act says that if a state has a history of racial discrimination, then any voting plan that they have, like voting districts, voting uh, proposals, have to be approved by the Federal Justice Department. That part of the law was recently struck down by the Supreme Court. So now uh, every state can entirely decide their own voting plans without approval from the federal government. And if you think that the voting plan is discriminating against you as a black person, you have to sue the government in order to prove it. 1965 also saw the publication of James Baldwin's most famous book, The Fire Next Time. James Baldwin, as I mentioned, is a very popular and important black author. He was also gay. So he had many different viewpoints on being outside of mainstream society. He was so mistreated in the United States that he later moved to live in France. He's a very smart and witty guy. The Fire Next Time is about the race riots of 1964 and 1965. So during the protests and demonstrations leading up to changing the law, some black people were so angry at uh, white police continuing to kill black people that they actually took up guns and fought the government. If you look at exactly what happened, you will agree that it was a rebellion. But because history is written by white people, we call them race riots. And James Baldwin is saying, to white people, OK, you managed to suppress the uprising this time. But if you don't change the way you treat black people, there will always be violence and one day you will not be able to control it. And to, to explain why he uses uh, arguments from history, from his personal experience and from the experience of many black people in the United States. People today still say, if you want to understand the black American experience, you should read this book. 1968, the most famous leader of black civil rights protests, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Uh, some people think he was killed by the FBI. And there's a reason why people think this. It later turned out that the FBI considered him a terrorist and had been listening in on his phone calls, had been trying to destroy his marriage, had been trying to destroy his reputation. So even though there's no proof that the FBI killed him, it would make sense. 1969, the Stonewall riots. This is often considered the beginning of the gay rights movement. Stonewall was a bar in New York, I think. Um, gay bars were illegal, but the police usually didn't care. But on that day, the police needed more arrests. So they raided the bar, killed lots of gay people. Uh, gay people had been suffering this for many years. They finally couldn't take it, and they started protesting, demonstrating, throwing rocks, etc. And that really started the nationwide movement for gay rights. It did not end that quickly, right? Gay rights had to keep being fought for all the way through the 90s. Uh, and through the 2010s, gay marriage in the United States was only made legal under President Obama. In like 2000, I want to say 2007. Somewhere around there, I can't quite remember. 
but it took a long time is what I'm trying to say. Um, gay people also had to suffer in the 80s through the AIDS pandemic. In the US, this was during the era of President Nixon, a Republican. And when people started getting AIDS, uh, Nixon's government was saying, oh, that's only for gay people. You don't have to worry. Of course, we know today that AIDS is not just limited to gay people. Anybody who has unprotected sex or has contact with another person's blood is at risk if the other person has AIDS. It's only after straight people started dying from AIDS that the government took action. Think about this. Gay people usually don't have sex with straight people very often. So how many gay people had to die before the government started finally trying to control this disease? Even today, gay people in the US who know about this history mourn an entire generation of talented, beautiful gay people lost because the government did not care. In 1982, the playwright David Mamet has a good uh, he had been writing for a while, but his most famous play is Glen Gary Glen Ross. This was later made into a movie starring Al Pacino and Alec Baldwin. The story is about some realtors, Fang Zong Yeze, who are having a bad turn of business. They are it's harder and harder to sell a house. So their their main company decides to motivate them. Uh, there are three main characters, uh, four main characters, and the, the company motivates them by saying, the person who sells the most houses next month gets a promotion and a raise and a bonus and a car. The person who sells the second most houses gets a set of steak knives. Uh, the person who sells the least number of houses gets fired. And then you, you, we follow these four realtors as they like agonize and feel depressed and they argue and they try and they can't sell houses until uh, one day their office is uh, stolen. The most valuable contact list is stolen. And this play is really a symbol of what we today call neoliberal capitalism. Capitalism is where money is the most important thing. Neoliberal capitalism is where money belonging to the individual person is the most important thing. Now the logic of the free market is not just about products and services, it is also about how you live your own life. The idea that time is money is one of the key ideas of neoliberal capitalism. If time really is money, then you should decide what to do based on how much money you can make in a given set of time. So the market logic has entered into your own life. And so with this, we have things like individual competition. Think about Uber drivers. Uber drivers do not work for the company. They work for themselves and sign a contract for the company. So if an Uber driver gets fired, they don't have bonuses, they don't have uh, severance pay, they don't have traditional insurance. So it's really a game of individual competition, not just between companies. And therefore, if everybody is competing against everybody else, then everybody could lose their job at any time. This is called precarious employment. Uh, precarious means like Ling Wei, Right, you could fall at any time. Uh, and unfortunately, this is still the kind of society that we live in today, especially in the US. In Taiwan, we famously have national health insurance. We have national labor insurance. We have um, many different items of social welfare that help people who need help. In the United States, there is very little of that. There's some, but it's not enough. And if you get work while you receive benefits, you could lose your benefits. 
uh, this logic is still behind many of the decisions made by the American government. So for example, if you're a poor person in the US and you get um, food stamps from the government, the government says every month we will give you some stamps and you can only use these stamps to buy certain kinds of food. So you don't even have the freedom to choose what kind of food to buy. And if you get a job that doesn't pay you enough, but it's more than the minimum wage, you will lose your food stamps. Uh, this is what happens when the government follows the logic of the market and of neoliberal capitalism. So this is a very big issue in the US more and more today, uh, and more and more works of literature are also either talking about it or following characters who suffer through it or some other uh, aspect of this problem. In 1985, Don DeLillo publishes his novel White Noise by Zhao Ying. A movie was made last year. I heard it's not a very good movie. I think this year. A movie was made this year. White Noise tells the story of a fictional college town where suddenly a white cloud comes to town and drives people crazy. It's considered a work of postmodernism. It's considered one of the first representative works of postmodernism. I hope you remember modernism, the search for tradition, fragmented mind, hard to read literature. Postmodernism is very similar, but the attitude is very different. Modernism is they have lost a tradition and they are looking for another kind of uh, cultural solidity, something they can depend on in the culture. Postmodernism is they have lost the tradition and they don't give a fuck. They don't care. Right? It says here, play. Now that they don't have one tradition, they can use every tradition. They can take from this and take from that and put it together and have fun with it. So when you read modernist literature, it feels hard and it feels like the author is talking about something you don't understand and you want to understand it. If you read postmodern literature, it feels like nothing makes sense. But it feels OK. It's not supposed to make sense. You can enjoy whatever you understand and you can skip whatever you don't understand. So it's the, the kind of literature looks very similar, but the attitude is completely the opposite. So here I've written postmodernism. You have fragments, some from here, some from there. Collage, ping tie, how you put these different things together. Spectacle, you enjoy something exciting that looks new and different. It may not have a deeper meaning, but it's fun. And then finally, again, popular culture. Modernism also cared about popular culture, but for modernists, they did not trust popular culture very much. But the postmodernists love popular culture. It's one of the things that they love to play with. So if modernism is about fragments and aesthetic politics, right? Postmodernism doesn't care about politics, just have fun. And of course, not caring about politics is also a kind of politics. 1987, we have Gloria Anzaldua's Borderlands or La Frontera. Uh, Anzaldua is a, she writes in English and Spanish. Uh, that's the two languages of this book. Borderlands is about the experiences of Hispanic and Mexican people and uh, native Mexicans in contemporary North American society. They seem to always have to cross the border between cultures, between languages, between different experiences. Uh, and this sort of launched, helped to launch the modern movement of multiculturalism. So the idea is no longer that different people should try to become American. 
Now the idea is that Americans should try to understand all the different people in their country, in their culture. Related to this, let's skip one. 1989, Amy, Amy Tan's The Joy Luck Club, Tian Mei, uh, is a Chinese American novelist. Uh, and this story is also about the Chinese American experience. And I include this in addition to Anzaldua because in the United States, Asians used to be, before the pandemic, used to be called the invisible minority. They were so successful and they so uh, uh, like fit in with white culture that many white people forgot that Asians were actually from a different culture. They just saw them as another member of like the mainstream culture. But people like Amy Tan wrote about that Asian background and helped remind the mainstream and white readers that there is a different background to Asian culture. And now today there is a large movement in the United States of like Chinese American, Taiwanese American, Indian American, um, Pakistani American, different Asian backgrounds of writers and culture. Like, you know, crazy rich Asians, right? Uh, Singaporean American, I guess. Going back, 1987, Toni Morrison's most famous novel, Beloved, was published. Morrison won a Nobel Prize for Literature because of her work. And her work focuses on black people in America, but the historical connections and historical trauma of black people in America. So like writers like James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, Langston Hughes were trying to explain the black experience to white Americans. Toni Morrison is trying to explain why the black experience is so different. What caused the suffering that black people go through today? How does white culture damage black people in their body and their mind. It's all very, very powerful literature, and it's also very, very sad. Uh, I would have assigned Toni Morrison's short story. She only wrote one really uh, famous short story, but that story depends on a very deep knowledge of black and white stereotypes. I don't think we have a deep knowledge of black and white stereotypes in this class, so the story would not have worked. So unfortunately, we don't have any short things we can read from her work, and I don't think you want to read a whole novel. Yeah, so uh, multiculturalism, understanding the different people in the culture also means being used to different languages in the culture. The United States does not have one official language. English just happens to be the language that everybody uses. But with multiculturalism, people started realizing that just because they know how to speak English does not mean we can understand them. And so to truly understand the different people in American society, they had to have an understanding of different languages. Not just Spanish, not just uh, African-American English, but also French. Places like New Orleans, New Orleans, are French culture. Also Native American languages, also Asian languages, all became part of American literature. 1989, Tim Berners-Lee invents the internet. So before 1989, we did not have the internet, if you can imagine that. 1996, David Foster Wallace wrote his most famous book, Infinite Jest, Wu uh, Jing de Wan Xiao, something like that. It is over 1,000 pages and it has footnotes. It's a novel. This is often considered the last important work of postmodernism and also considered to be a masterpiece of postmodernism. After that, people sort of felt like, I guess that's it. He wrote a thousand page postmodern novel. Nobody can do better than that. And the, the postmodernism started ending. The political problems started getting worse. People started to care about politics again. 
And that later movement is represented in Ben Lerner's 2010 novel, 1004. This is a time. If you've seen Back to the Future, this is the time when the lightning strikes the clock tower. And so the main character has to get ready to go back to the future by this time. And this novel follows the main character walking around New York City as he deals with different kinds of situations that are all related to neoliberal capitalism as it relates to the economy, art, the environment, having children, marriage, and what it means to really interact with people from different cultures. It's one of those books that if you try to write a summary, it doesn't make sense. But when you read it, you truly feel like you are part of that time and place in American culture. Um, I've also heard from people that it's apparently a very hard book to read. I thought it was hilarious, um, but that's just me. So uh, in this unit, we're going to read four authors and we're going to touch on many of these ideas. Questions? Okay, not four authors, like five authors. Some of them are poets. So it's like two poems from one person. Um, right, so for next week, please read as much as you can of Sonny's Blues. I should tell you what the story is about, right? To help you read. OK, the main character is a high school teacher. Uh, his brother got locked up in jail for using heroin. Later on, uh, his brother is released. He comes to live with the main character and his wife. Uh, and his brother tries to understand. Sorry, the main character tries to understand why his brother, Sonny, would use heroin and destroy his life tries to understand what could lead his young, innocent brother into this kind of lifestyle. And the answer is related to blues music. So that's the story. Uh, try to read as much as you can, and we'll talk about it next week. <laughs>